Welcome, everybody, to Do More Better. This is our second episode on a series about ADHD. The first one we talked about diagnostics and, and identifying ADHD, and this one is about medication and the start of an intervention talk. But if you have a child or if you're an individual that was diagnosed with ADHD, you are probably going to have a conversation with your doctor about medication. And there's a bunch of them. Um, I'd say it's one of the like few diagnoses, probably uh, ADHD and bipolar, that you're probably going to have a conversation about medication. Well, <laughs> I mean, depending on who you go to, right? I mean, yeah. oh, depression, probably. Yeah, probably depending yeah. on who you go to, but for sure uh, with ADHD. We do want to preface everything that we say here that we are not suggesting that you have to take medications if you've been diagnosed with ADHD. We're going to talk at length about the medications that are associated with treating ADHD, but we we always have to take that you should treat people like individuals. What yep. intervention fits one person may not fit another person. Right. And while there was is a, you know, well documented research backed treatment approach that has to do with medication, that doesn't necessarily mean that it might be the best fit for you or for your child. And it's always a balance of trying to figure out what's going to be the best suit, you know, best we're, well suited for you. I just said the only thing I'd add to that, we're, we're not going either way. We're not saying they should or you shouldn't right. really take medication. Hopefully you have a pediatrician or you have a psychologist that you work with that knows you very well and you'll have a conversation. We're, we're just going to give information today. Okay. Was that, is that fair? No, absolutely. Uh, okay. Okay. So if you have... A uh, family member or you yourself have been diagnosed with ADHD, you have probably talked with your primary care physician about stimulant medication. And that is the number one go-to medication intervention. Well, you're already smiling. I just smiling. Yeah. It's so funny that uh, stimulant, it's, it's such a weird thing to take. We have somebody who's, who is uh, hyperactive, impulsive, um, inattentive, uh, and we're talking about stimulant medication. And Man, I don't know who 40 years ago decided, like, <laughs> I think I'm going to give this this hyperactive kid a stimulant. I mean, right. it, it would not have, like, on paper made a whole lot of sense, but man, yeah, I mean, it really ended up being pretty fa- I, pretty effective. I don't know why I've thought about that a thousand times, but right now it just hit me as, like, it's a funny thing that we're talking about, but that's what, when we're talking about ADHD meds, we're 90% of the time talking about stimulant meds. I always, I always love to daydream about, like, being in on conversations where, like, that would have made sense. Like, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like, who was sitting in a, in, in, in a, in a you know, office, like, you know what? We're going to make them, like, pizza, and they're going to like anchovies, uh, and they're ninjas. Oh, just regular ninjas? No, no, no. Not regular ninjas. Right. Teenage and turtles. And I remember thinking, like, who is ever going to go... That's a great idea. See Jimmy running around over there. I'm going to give him. A I'm going to give him a stimulant bet. And who's thinking like, yeah, man, that sounds like uh, a good idea. But it totally worked out. Yeah, it worked out well. Yeah, yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Digital Turtles worked out well too. <laughs> it yeah, worked out, it worked well, out really yeah. well. Yeah. So, uh, as far as when a, a a medication is an intervention for a kid, uh, I want to reiterate something we said from the depression episode that uh, a good medication is about making something occur for somebody. If you, you know, I gave with SSRIs, we were talking about the analogy of, of the kid and, and shoving cheeseburgers down their throat. But if you have a kid who is so starving that they can't focus on the math test, yeah, give the kid a cheeseburger so right. that they can set that aside and actually take the math test. I've, I worked with kids before where if, if they hadn't taken their stimulant medication, we really weren't going to get therapy done they had about a 15 second attention span Mm -hmm. and i could see right away in the middle of a one-on-one session if they've taken it or not and when that child was taking their stimulant medication it occasioned it made happen right us doing therapy together and it was a great intervention right so the behaviorists will call that an establishing operation uh and that's a good term go go wikipedia that one uh, <laughs> put a link to it and so establishing operation is something that happens before the actual behavior that increases the possibility or the likelihood that's going to occur and right. so um so establishing operation for doing well for on a test the night before might be eight hours of sleep uh might be breakfast the morning before and, and so this medication it acts like an establishing operation um i i would say when i first started clinical work i was i was pretty like we all have our biases you know it might have changed over time and i think yours have too i was pretty the anti-medication is and i think that's why people get into psychology mm-hmm. not psychiatry and now i probably look at it a little differently a little more open and um and sometimes i look at it like a set of glasses like you it, it, you can try to teach a kid to read 
Um, but if they can't see the material, they're not going to get it. Right. You know, and so sometimes having that medication there is an establishing operation for being able to focus on the stimulus um, and being able to actually pick it up. I think I think I've just become personally like so child focused that it's like whatever helps the kid. I I, I really don't yeah. care whatever helps the kid. You know, if you if you were to sit back and go divorce right or wrong, it's like I I really don't mm, care functional. what's going to help the kid. You know. Yeah. Right. The other thing, maybe we didn't touch on this with SSRIs in, in the depression episode also, is sometimes I think medication has to do with how much intervention does a kid need that uh, I, I think of stimulant meds as taking a car wherever you were walking before. Mm-hmm. So if you if you have a kid with ADHD and you're trying to do intervention with them, if you need to go around the block, maybe you don't need to do medication. Maybe you just take a walk and do what you need to do. But if you're going from New York to Seattle, maybe you ought to have a car because that's going to be a really long, hard road mm-hmm. to tow. Or, yeah, I think I said that right. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, it's response to intervention. Uh, and so kind of what you're, you're talking about. So uh, um, back pre, probably I don't know, pre-IDEA, so pre-Individuals with Disabilities Act, uh, the, it kind of was you wait until a kid is failing and then you do the, the, the strongest intervention you can. And then this idea of response to intervention, came, which is kind of what you're saying, is response to intervention came along is once you're starting to struggle, we, we try, try a small intervention. Uh, we see if it helps. If it doesn't help, we increase the intervention. We see if it helps. If it doesn't help, we, so you're, you're basically saying we, we need to match the intervention to the need. Um, and if the need is, you know, your kid needs to do calculus um, and because they want to be an engineer, then we're going to have to look at some pretty heavy interventions here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, stimulant medication. We we talked in our depression episode about SSRIs and how mm-hmm. there's a major, you know, confounding issue with placebo and whether or not it is actually doing what we think it's doing. We've got way better research on stimulant meds. I mean, they work. Uh, the research basically says, yeah, they work. They reduce symptoms of ADHD, hyperactivity, inattention, impulse control, skills of executive functioning. Like, yeah, stimulant meds pretty well work. Yeah, this one's hard to say. It's placebo. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think anybody out there who's watching this and doesn't have ADHD and took Adderall to study for a test one day or write a paper knows that it, it works. <laughs> so. Right. And, and I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're an adult and you took – uh, you took a stimulant, you, you would have an experience, probably something along the lines of, man, I only ate half a sandwich for lunch and got <laughs> yeah. everything done. I needed to get right. done. That's, right. a, that's a great med. Which is why I think with this one, you have to be really careful with, uh, sometimes with medications, we think if you take, so if I take an antibiotic and things get better, it means I had a bacterial infection. Uh, if I take Adderall and I'm paying attention better, it doesn't mean I have ADHD. Um, because it works for 70% of people who take it. It really just, it, it, without side effects, without major side effects at least. Uh, so it, that, it, I guess what I'm saying is just be, we have to be careful with it. Uh, you remember the uh, Seattle scandal where the cornerbacks were caught taking Adderall? The Seattle. Uh, sorry, Seattle Seahawks. Oh, the, the football cornerback. I, well, I remember there was. Yeah, it was. It was kind of going around the NFL. It also goes around the Air Force pretty strong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of missions flown with yeah. uh, the aid of stimulant medication. On the go but, pills, or yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you normally think of of athletes and you're worried about testosterone. And yeah. uh, I I want to say it was Richard Sherman, the former cornerback of the Seattle Seahawks. But it, I don't quote me on that. I don't. I'm not totally sure. But I know that uh, Richard Sherman, if you're watching this, don't sue us. Yes, please. Uh, I know that there were two. <laughs> Seattle Seahawks cornerbacks that got caught using Adderall, and one of them's response I thought was pretty, yeah, pretty uh, authentic. Was like, yeah, we got a 500 page playbook. Like I right. needed to do this in order to study what I needed to study. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's the, that's the problem. Is so we look at these medications, they're they're stimulants. Um, we're going to get into names. Or- are you, you know, well, what, actually, we'll, yeah. Why don't you go? We'll, we'll get into names in just a second. But I think what they what they do is they help with the symptoms and. The problem is that a lot of us have these symptoms. A lot of us get off task. A lot of us feel uh, unfocused. We feel hyperactive at times, and, and they help with that. Um, and, and let's see here, the main main ones you're probably going to hear Adderall. Uh, so we wait. Let's so say we probably talk class. So, um, so methylphenidate is the main one you're going to hear, um, or amphetamine salt. Uh, methylphenidate you hear Ritalin, Concerta, Focalin are probably the three most common. Am I missing one there? No, but there's, I mean. You, there, you often say that by the time the episode's done, there's going to be another There's going to be three more by the time we get done with this. And then the amphetamine salt, Adderall is your main one. You hear Vivance, you hear a lot more these days. Um, uh, and then now uh, so they've been around long enough that you can start having generic names like methylphenidate. 
Um, and so, but, but the most part, you know, you have the kind of two classes of meds. You've got the methylphenidate, you've got the amphetamine salt, both basically doing the th same thing, increasing your dopamine levels. So it makes it easier for you to focus. All very focused on that frontal lobe. Yep. I mean, your, your frontal lobe is, I don't, I don't think this is hyperbolic of me to say, but I mean, it's pretty much what makes, makes us human. I and mean, for sure. that, that, that organizing, planning, the skill sets that go along with your frontal lobe and this medication is going right after it. We, we should probably do, if you're watching this, you should do a drinking game that every time we go back to evolution, you should have to take a drink <laughs> <laughs> because you can look at the brain and how the brain evolved. It, it, it came, started from the inside and worked its way out. Mm -hmm. And so everything on the outside of this stuff is the stuff that makes us human, that yeah. makes us separate from the other. But yeah, uh, that bottom stuff is basically alligator. Uh, it, yeah, that it, bottom it, stuff it is, is reptilian. It, kill it, have sex with it. <laughs> yes. It's like, that limbic system stuff is, is basically fight or flight. And that's like what most all animals have. It's as we work our way out and we get out to this frontal region out here that that's the struggle in ADHD and that's what this medication helps with. Yeah. If you ever see somebody that has like a brain injury, it's going after those exterior parts and that alligator part is typically pretty well preserved. Pretty, that eat it, kill it, have sex with it part. It keeps going really well. I'm so proud of you for saying have <laughs> sex with it. <laughs> uh, not what you want to say. Um. But it, it, either way, stimulants are really well documented to help with symptoms of ADHD. Not only are they well documented, they're also well documented that the earlier you use them, the better outcomes are. Uh, and again, you know, if a random person took it, you'd probably have an experience of like, well, okay, I get understand why that helps. Yes, they they were, and that's like so. You can go look at the research on this. There's huge studies, big sample sizes. You see, uh, most across the board improvements. Um, it it works. You know, it doesn't seem to be a, a placebo effect or anything like that. It just seems to actually help kids focus. It helps with the the inattentiveness, hyperactivity. You know, there are certain things it's not going to help with. Yeah, it's, it's not going to rebuild remedial skills that you need to work on. No, no, you're still going to have to go. Uh, behavior wise, that's probably. Some, I don't. Know, sometimes what do I don't know? Like I think sometimes it it kind of helps with stuff. But if you, like a lot of times you have a kid with ADHD or you yourself an adult with ADHD, when you grew, grew up, you also had a little bit of behavior there too, some noncompliance, defiance, things like that. Um, I would say. I generally say it's not going to help with that, but sometimes it does. And that like, it helps you focus on the instruction. Well, uh, it's going to help you focus on instruction, but let's say, you know, you're a sophomore in, you know, high school English class. It's uh -huh. not going to make up for like a fourth grade reading level. You're going to have to go right. and get a tutor and, and work on building those academic skills, but it should help capitalize on those, those, skills you're trying to learn and, and recoup yeah and that's not what I, I was kind of more thinking um some of the families i work with i see you know this period in the morning where they've taken their medication and they really struggle getting through the morning routine and they're waiting for it to kick in yeah they're waiting for it to kick in and then once it kind of kicks in it's like they can get through the morning routine better so it, it seems or like night when it or then it's worn off and then at nighttime you do see that nighttime irritability you see that like it's it's more difficult to get calm down go to bed things like that uh and so what i go back to that, what a old pediatrician i used to work with said is that there's um, there's no pill that's going to fix asshole. <laughs> like, if, if your kid, if you're being a jerk or you're a jerk, or you, you, it's not going to fix that, but it might help you focus on getting through the routine. I've had families even say to me that once their their child started taking stimulants, it's almost like, yeah, he's kind of you know arguing more with this. And I think, well, you know, this is making thoughts more salient and they're able to pay attention. Yeah. They can probably stay on topic and argue with you better. Now <laughs> it, the, the idea, you know, you mentioned oppositionality and some non-compliance, like, mm -hmm. Taking stimulant medication, you may see some improvement there just because this medication is so effective. It can help attention. Yeah. It can help paying. You know, you're not as easily distracted from go clean your room or something. But if your kid was not cleaning the room because they were distracted, but they were not cleaning the room because they were telling you, screw you, I'm not going to go clean my room. Right. This is not going to impact that. And that's why, you know, I think we mentioned it in the last one, but uh, the research really says that behavioral intervention and medical intervention. Medical intervention helps. Behavioral interventions help. It's really the two together that right. matter. And understanding the function of the behavior is what kind of what you're bringing up. And so if, if the the function is avoidance, you know, it may not make it better. If the function is like it, it actually was establishing operation, like they didn't have the ability to focus on the act, the what you're asking them to do, which isn't necessarily a function, but it's the cause, I guess what I'm saying. And this would fix that. At least would help with it. 
I don't know um, if anybody's got to understand that last sentence unless oh, they were a psychologist. Yeah. Say, wait, that, wait, say that the way your grandma does it. Uh, okay, so uh, we haven't done an episode on function of behavior yet, but we've probably talked about it a little bit. So trying to figure out why a behavior is occurring is something that's really important for us as psychologists. Uh, predominantly, most behaviors are going to be... Uh, I'm trying to say this out sounded like, like a psychologist. Uh, most behaviors, um, they usually are to get your attention, to avoid something, to escape, get out of something, uh, to get yourself something tangible or to entertain yourself. Uh, and kind of what you were bringing up is if the kid is, is just straight avoiding, you know, like giving a stimulant medication may not change that. Now, if they're not doing the thing you asked because they're struggling with hearing the information or processing the information, then it would actually help. Yeah. Hopefully that explains. Yep. It. Yeah. We we'll, we'll, we uh, we need to quit saying we'll do an episode, but functions yeah. of behavior. But like, uh, so what? Why you drink every time we it? say we're going to have an episode? <laughs> yes, have a drink now. Uh, on evolution, and uh, the next time we'll have an episode on this. Yeah. Well, uh, we mentioned too that you know a lot of interventions. I feel like I'm doing with family sometimes is like, hey, wake this kid up 30 minutes early and give them their meds, or uh, just with, with stimulant medication, the half-life is about 12 hours, which mm -hmm. means that's really, you know, the teachers get all the benefit of a kid taking that medication and about five o'clock, that medication is no longer at a functional dose in their bodies. And that's when they come home to you ready for dinner. And that's what you've got to deal with as a parent. So. Mm -hmm. Which is, I don't know is always a bad thing. You know, sometimes we have to learn how to how to live when we're not on our medications. And, uh, you know, some of the psychiatrists that I've worked with, uh, have struggled with stimulant medications because they help so much that kids never learn really how to, how to live without them. I, I, feel, I feel like I hear people say that a lot. Yeah. They're, they're worried that the medication is going to somehow, uh, like supplement skill development or something, which to be fair, if, if, if you do neglect the idea that there is work to be done after you take the stimulant medication, yeah, you're probably mm -hmm. are setting somebody up for, pretty poor response once they stop right that and it's one of the things i like about this medication too is like we find out pretty quickly if it's going to work yeah i think that is a major benefit yeah for so when we go back to the ssri episode we're looking at two to four weeks depending on that's your, even being friendly that's right? being nice yeah uh, you know we're, we're we're not sure if it's really going to work for you and we find out day one within 45 minutes to an hour depending on which one of those medications and for those who are interested you can actually look at how quickly things kick in based on which medication you know like Focalin kicks in slightly differently than concerta kicks in slightly differently than adderall and lasts a little bit longer um and so uh with these we find out pretty quickly if it's going to work we find out pretty quickly there's going to be side effects um and we we find out pretty quickly right when it wears off yeah uh, and at that point we we hope you're working with a psychologist and you've got a good behavior plan in place I think that is so underrated as in terms of an intervention for families that, you know, if you were talking to a family with a depressed uh, child and, and you were saying, okay, about six weeks from now, we'll know if this, mm -hmm. this intervention is going to be of any benefit, which I, I'd say most things are that way. I mean, if you were working with somebody athletically and you said, okay, we're going to change your bat swing in baseball, mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to figure out if that's going to work. Right. But if I told somebody right now, hey, in about 48 hours, you're going to be able to know if this is going to help your kid. That is worth its weight in gold mm -hmm. right there. And we're also going to find out pretty quickly if they have side effects too. Yeah. Uh, if it's not worth it, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about side effects. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, major side effects, um, sleep. It's going to hurt your sleep. It, well, Eating and sleeping are, I think, number one. Eating and sleeping the first, yeah. Um, and so way less uh, hungry. Um, and I, what, I've, what I actually think is they just don't focus on eating. They just get so focused on what they're doing. They don't think about eating as much. I don't. I have no data for that. That's just what I think is happening. Um, because it's a stimulant, too, it can affect sleep. Um, and, you know, the research is... Uh, pretty clear in kids with ADHD already struggle with sleep. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's restless just, sleepers, yeah. tossing and turning. Yep. Um, other, other, I mean, other things you've seen. I, I actually, uh, I feel like I see a lot of the time that the kids do say that their appetite is less. That yeah. I, I feel that's like I, I'm almost working around uh, like a daily routine where it's like, okay, let's load this kid up with waffles and stuff at breakfast and then let's feed him a nice big meal at dinner time because they're probably coming home eating half their lunch at yeah. best. And I, I tell families too that you should pretty well expect that if you found a functional dose, it's going to impact their appetite. Right. Uh, a lot of interventions I do are antecedent interventions trying to, uh, an antecedent intervention is something that tries to head off the problem before it occurs. Yeah. Like I'm like, hey, at two o'clock, this kid needs to down 
like a peanut butter bagel. I don't care if he's hungry or not. You mm-hmm. know, uh, that, that to me is, you know, half the world is already on a diet trying to not eat something when they're hungry. And with my kids with ADHD, it's like, just because you're not hungry does not mean you don't need to fuel your body. Right. So at two o'clock, we're going to put something in you that's going to matter for five o'clock. Right. Yeah. I said, that's, that's interesting. You say that. Cause I don't think I've, we've ever talked about that before. I said the same thing, just because you don't feel hungry. doesn't mean you're not hungry. You need right. to eat. Uh, we're going to have planned schedules when you eat. And if we can get some food in the morning, um, before you go to school and that medication is kicked in even better. Uh, sometimes in the evening, I'll let my kids uh, like eat whatever the, the heck they want. Every calorie is a good calorie. Sometimes yeah. some, some of them are very, you know, kid starts out very spelt anyway. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, we're going to give you a minute or you're going to not gonna eat so much. Mm-hmm. We, uh, some of the times I say you brought up the, the kids say they're not hungry. I, I have some of my kids who just say they don't feel like themselves on it too. Yeah. Like I'm a zombie or my personality's not, gone. Yeah. Like, um, you know, they kind of were the life of the party anyway, the attention seekers, the fun ones. And now they just, oh, well, they're focused and they don't feel like they are themselves is one that I hear sometimes. I don't, I'd say I don't hear that as often as I do the sleep and diet, but I do hear it. I think I hear parents say, my kid looks like a zombie. I hear my teens say, I don't feel like myself. I feel, yes. And I, and I think probably both of those are just two different observations of the same thing. But I mean, if you had a kid who was hyperactive and impulsive and probably initiating in a lot of ways, and all of a sudden they stop doing all those things, it's a pretty stark contrast. Mm-hmm. You probably do look at them and think like, oh man, like their, their personality has changed greatly. Uh, and I feel like it's almost like clockwork that my eighth and ninth grade typically males are going to want to stop taking the medication to see how they do because they feel like they're not themselves when they take it. Right. I just am laughing about that. Like, uh, now I'm really functional and I'm getting really good grades. I don't like being that way. (laughs) I really liked messing around and not paying attention. Well, I mean, I think that's another concern though. So one of the concerns is that perhaps the stimulant medication inhibits play. Yeah. And we talked a lot about this before, uh, particularly in the, in the episode on diagnostics for ADHD, but you know, we live in a world where, you know, eight hours of your day at school, you should not be initiating play. I remember I had some kid in like kindergarten or first grade say that like, oh yeah, one of the rules at lunch was they weren't supposed to talk. And I was like, what in the heck are you mm-hmm. talking about? That's a rule. And I think we might be inhibiting their play and that, you know, that could be a major part of your personality. If you're an ex- externalizing, yep. you know, uh, if you're an, uh, an initiator and you go talk to people and all of a sudden you're not doing those things. And yep. you know, people, uh, your, your friends are going to have a reaction too. They're not going to know how to interpret your new behavior. Like what you are studying tonight. What are you talking about? Like, let's go out and have fun. And you're not doing that. Yeah. I could see how people interpret that as, imp- as personality a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the other, as you, uh, the other one I think of too, and I think we both had seen this one differently. We've talked about this before. Um, is uh, a little bit of irritability. Um, I, I tend to see it when the medication is wearing off mm-hmm. or before the med- they've taken the medication. I know you've talked about before you think it's a dosing issue too, right? I see it two different ways. So uh, maybe not irritability. I, I see the emotionality. Yeah. I, I, the pediatricians I work with uh, in uh, in regard to try and do best by the kids and not not give them too high of a mm-hmm. dose, they always start on these low doses. Mm-hmm. And so it depends on which medication you're taking, but about five milligrams would be like the absolute smallest dose you can take. And that is literally for some of them, like cutting a medication and in half. I mean, just, I'm going to reiterate that it depends on the medication right. because you'll, you'll see Vyvanse's up to like 70 milligrams. So mm-hmm. it depends, but yeah. So you'll see these kids take these five milligrams and I'll have a lot of them come back where the, where the parents are like, yeah, they're real emotional. And it's like, hey, what's for dinner? And it's meatloaf and tater tots. And the kids, I just didn't want tater tots. And it's like, mm-hmm. whoa, that is not normal for them. Mm-hmm. I think that's a low dosing issue a lot of the times. And the moment you bump up to, to 10 milligrams or something mm-hmm. higher that you, you see a better response. Uh, but then on the other side of it, I, I also think that, you know, you said when the medication wears off. That, I, uh, yeah. I do think that a lot of stimulant medication and one of the concerns and it's, this is a derivative of meth. I mean, it's right there in the name, you know, <laughs> methylphenidate, methylphenidate. Mm-hmm. And that, that is, I, I, I think sounds scarier than it is, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it's not, there's no denying it. it. It's, it's related to methamphetamines, but, but I do think it's asking you to use your resources and burn hotter where you weren't before. And by the time you get to five or six o'clock, where just about every human being mm-hmm. is pretty, 
taxed by five or six yeah. o'clock. Your emotional resources, your cognitive resources are drained by that point. I think these kids with ADHD have burned through yeah. everything they've got. Yeah. And now it's six o'clock and they've got no, you know, no faculties and no resources left. It's like, yeah, they're probably going to be pretty irritable. They've been working. Yeah. 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 That's where I see it more. I, like, I, I do see the, uh, what you're talking about, the low dosing. Usually when I see that is some of the pediatricians that I've worked with uh, are concerned there's going to be a side effect show up. So they do a low dose hoping that if there is a weird side effect show up, and we're going to get into some of the other weird ones that might show up, uh, that it will show up at that low dose and it won't be quite as bad. Um, but you're, you know, now that you're saying it, they, they, uh, they oftentimes don't start at a therapeutic dose. So if you're a parent or right. you yourself are, wa- are, are taking a stimulant and you're noticing it's not really doing much, it may be because your pediatrician is being conservative because they know what they're doing. Um, and maybe a, a, a slight increase is actually going to help. Yeah. Um, talk to your pediatrician on that one, but it, therapeutic dose, I think is a big concept though. I mean, you know, for one individual, 10 milligrams might do it for another individual. It might be 27 milligrams right. for a different individual. It might be 60. And so what a function functional doses comes down to the individual yep. and I think that the therapy to do, yeah so in, in to try to find that therapy to dose what we're looking for is the 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 best symptom reduction with the least side effects yeah um, but as we get symptom reduction we usually will get increased side effects and there's the hard part of finding that therapeutic dose yeah and so we're, I think what we're hoping with that with that low dose is that we we catch something you know they're gonna have a weird side effect uh, before we get into a high dose of it maybe we should get those weird side effects yeah because they're uh, scary. Yeah. I mean, ticks is the main one. That, 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 and, and ticks really is, throws people for a loop. Right. We, so a tick, when we're talking about a tick, is um, you know, like an involuntary motor behavior. So it can be like a, a neck roll, an eye roll, like a blinking. blinking um, we throw clearing. Throw clearing. So it's something, and it's, it, I, I'm surprised at how often I, I see a kid come in on a stimulant medication who has developed a tick. And I'm like, oh, well, that's from your stimulant medication. And the parent had no idea that that was a possible side effect. Um, it, I mean, maybe I'm surprised at how often it's rare still though, probably yeah. I should say, but I mean, still, uh, I, I, th- I think, uh, scary side effect. I mean, if your kid's not, doesn't eat as much and you think you can load them up at dinner, like that's pretty manageable. But if your kid starts moving and blinking when you weren't expecting it, that <laughs> I think that scares families. It, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It, it, well, sometimes it's, there's a little bit of a. Um, a feeling of comfort. It was like, this is just from your medication. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have Tourette's all of a sudden. Uh, so Tourette syndrome is a, is a disorder that, that, you know, you have lots of, uh, psychomotor or, or, or motor tics, uh, that are uncontrollable. And just because you, you got on a stimulant and you developed a tick doesn't mean you have Tourette's, you know, it, so sometimes they go away. Uh, I would say majority of the time we, we actually in, in the field will call them transient ticks, you know, because most, most of them go away. Uh, sometimes it's just, is, is this bad enough that we should get off the medication or is the, the ben- are the benefits of the medication um, outweighing the tick? And usually that's what I find. I think I can count on one hand when the pediatricians I work with want to keep doing it, even though there's ticks like they see. Oh, really? Yeah, they're done. I feel yeah. like the moment they see that they're like, Ooh, bad setup. Let's change that. Huh. I, I would say I would say my conversations are usually more with parents, and when I let them know this is a tick from the medication, what do you think? And they they usually are, would they rather stick with the medication because the, uh, a lot of times with ticks, and uh, if we do an episode on treatment of ticks, you know, we start with does this bother you? Yeah. Because if it doesn't bother, I know plenty of people with ticks. I have a little one, like with my back. I pop my back. Sometimes we're talking. Maybe maybe you'll see it on here. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. You know, it's just this little thing we do, you know, everybody has a little thing, you know, and if it doesn't bother you, then we don't do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, psych- psychotic symptoms. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I, this is a, a, a really rare Bearer. side effect for stimulants, but uh, there can be psychotic symptoms. Your yep. kid can see something that, that isn't there. They can have hallucinations. That one is one that I think if, if that occurs, I mean, that's an immediate stop and, and go talk to your pediatrician and, and you need to to stop the medication. Yeah. I'm thinking I've seen it once in 10 years. Oh yeah. Yeah. At this point, I think it's pretty rare. I, I, if I I, I don't quote me on the research, I want to say it's like under 1%. It's very, yeah. But it, it, it's usually anytime you start a medication, you want to talk with your kid about like, let me know. Right. If something weird happens, like if you start like hearing things or seeing things, you might and, be scared of what you get back. When yeah, you tell a, a teenager, yeah. tell me if anything weird happens. But I mean, to go back to the the SSRI uh, video, like let me know if you start having thoughts about taking your life. You yeah. know, uh, like have those conversations. I think you and I have gotten oddly comfortable with having these conversations with people. Most people aren't comfortable with having those conversations. There's no problem with having it. 
Uh, you might hear some weird things back, but I'd rather hear them than not hear them. Right. I, I imagine, I, I don't know the research on it. I'm interested to look it up after we get done with this episode. But yeah. I would imagine too, you know, the idea here is this medication is making thoughts more salient and it's yeah. easier to pay attention to. And so if you have a child who has, uh, we'll get into this at some point, but you know, a pretty, pretty external locus of control, yeah. pr- you know, high stressors, high, high, you know, large amount of red flags. That to me says, well, if we're making thoughts already that were pretty disorganized and we're making them more salient you that's a recipe to me where like you could easily see something like psychotic symptoms for sure anytime you alter attention i I think most um mental health issues boil down to attention at some point Uh, and so when you alter it like it can change uh, how you experience things the Uh, the other the other things about admission for concerns is there's not really good long-term research that once you stop taking it, you don't get any, you don't really get a whole lot of benefit. There's some long-term research that says maybe it inhibits growth, which, you know, yeah. I think p- people think the same thing about coffee. And that's why you're not giving a 13 year old coffee, but yeah. it's, it's, it's probably not to the extent that you thought you were going to have a kid who was six, four, and now they're five, six. Right. Like that's They've got their the genetic. Option. Yeah. They're probably going to get fairly close to that, but there is at least, there are at least some uh, research that says it can inhibit growth. I, I imagine that's related to the diet stuff too. Okay, so second class of medications we were talking about, which, I don't know, <laughs> there's a reason we start with stimulants, because they're pretty effective. Yeah, this other class, labeled non-stimulants, are just not as effective with all the symptoms of ADHD. But there was a huge demand back early 2000 for a non-stimulant medication. I think for the very thing that we brought up earlier is, this is weird. Why are we putting kids on a stimulant medication? And, and you, you, there's a ton of reasons why a kid may not be suitable for a stimulant medication mm-hmm. in the first place. You mm-hmm. know, they've got a, a heart issue or they do develop ticks and the family gets weirded out. You know, there might be a, a, a ton of reasons why you can't do a stimulant medication. Yeah. So, yeah, there are other medications out there. Like comorbidity between like Tourette's and ADHD too is fairly high. Yeah, so, real high. And if you already have ticks or or if it gets misdiagnosed, you know, you misdiagnose Tourette's as ADHD, the, the stimulants are going to make it way worse. Yeah. So there, there's a reason to have, and I understand why parents were were, were pushing for stimulant medications, uh, or non sorry non stimulant medications. Uh, but when Stratera came out, which is the kind of the first major one, uh, it was there was a high demand. Yeah. So there's stimulants, and then so eloquently worded non stimulants. But why don't you tell people? There's going to be a quiz after this. Yeah. Why don't you tell people a, a few of those? So uh, Stratera is the main one you're going to hear. Uh, so stimulant medications, what they do is increase dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, non stimulant medications, Stratera is kind of an odd one. Um, it's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it, it's similar to actually the way an antidepressant works, aside from it's not on serotonin, it's on norepinephrine. Different neurotransmitters. Uh, yeah, so this neurotransmitter helps um, with, with so norepinephrine is like when you um, you're aware and you're you're like kind of get your fight or flight, uh, you, you're, your your adrenaline kicks in. Non stimulants work on central nervous system. We mentioned earlier that stimulants work on that frontal lobe, and so we're talking about spine and that lower part of the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, Intuniv is a new one you'll hear. Gua- uh, guanfacine, I think, is the generic name for that now because it's generic. Um, I think the generic name for uh, Stratera is atomoxidine, which... Oh, is it? Yeah, it was initially an antidepressant is what they thought. But it didn't work very well as an antidepressant. It's kind I of know there, there are some other, that. you know, uh, there's some other antidepressants that have shown improvements with symptoms of ADHD, like tricyclics and that kind of thing. But Stratera mm-hmm. is probably the one that you're you're going to see for... A, a real treatment for ADHD symptoms if you're not dealing with a stimulant medication. Right. And it does seem to, like, if you look at the research, it does seem to help. It doesn't just, it just doesn't seem to help as much as the stimulant. It doesn't seem to help as much. And we mentioned earlier that one of the major benefits of stimulant medication was how quickly you could tell yeah. it was going to work. I mean, we're talking 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. Stratera, I think they updated their, uh, their time range to like, 45 days before it has kicked in fully. That's Which, a really long yeah, time to wait. Yeah, would make sense because the reason it's not as similar is not increasing your dopamine. You know, it's not doing it quickly. It's 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 blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine, so it's going to take some time for that to happen. So it makes similar sense. Similar to the SSRIs. Similar to the time. SSRIs, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, and one of the things with... Uh, that with that particular one, Stratera, it does have a black box warning too. So, the, so the black box warning, I think we brought it up in the SSRI episode, is is a warning that it might increase suicidality. Um, and so, 
you know, like whether or not it's the medication causing that, or you have a kid who has attention problems and now is on medication. There's all kinds of variables that couldn't cause that. But like it's a one chicken of those, and egg approach for like my ADHD has impacted my school and now my mood is low. And right, who knows what caused it? But in the the sample group, there were some kids who had increased suicidality, and I I do think there was one kid who committed suicide in the in the sample group. Yeah, uh, I remember you telling me it that was at some yeah. Point. It's a low number, but it, it's something to be aware of. Again, which is get back to the talk to your kids, yeah. you know, or talk or yourself. Talk to your talk to your doctor. You know, let them know if anything weird is changing in you, um, so that way they can know to change your medication or change your dose. Have I told you my analogy for Stratero when I'm talking to families? No. <laughs> so, uh, he and I both play guitar, and uh, not very well. <laughs> not well, <laughs> does F chord really exist? Uh, <laughs> uh, when when Stratero came out. Uh, it, it was kind of billed as uh, helping with both symptoms of ADHD and some symptoms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that ended up playing out was uh, Taylor, a guitar maker, came out with a guitar that is both an electric mm -hmm. guitar and an acoustic guitar. Yeah. I mean, you literally just flip a switch and it turns right into an electric guitar, flip a switch, you go back to an acoustic playing ability not not just an electrified acoustic right. but literally you're supposed to be both guitars and the reviews of that guitar when it came out was basically like i mean right yeah it does both of these but if you want a good electric just go buy a good electric and if you want a good acoustic just go buy a good acoustic it right. kind of does both mediocre that's kind of my take on stratera it kind of does both of those mediocre if you right. got a kid with anxiety I mean, maybe it'll help with anxiety a little bit. If you got a kid with ADHD, it kind of helps with the ADHD symptoms, but you'd probably be better going towards one or the other. Right. And the one time I do see it uh, is when uh, you have a kid with tics already. Right. You know, so then that's a, that makes sense. So then they try it. Or, or there's comorbid issues of anxiety and ADHD. Yeah. Which happens. Yeah. Uh, well, for sure it happens. Yeah. And it, I think back to the, uh, when you play a role playing game too, you know, like if you're going to, if you're going to make a character that's good at everything, they're I'm not assuming everybody's playing a role playing yeah, game. Yeah. Everybody out here has played Skyrim or Dark Souls or something like or that. Dungeons, or, and, Dungeons Dragons. and Dragons. Yeah. Uh, is that if you try to make a character that's good at everything, they're usually not very good at right. anything at all. And, and so that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I think I stole it from you. Did you? <laughs> like, you, can, you can, if you try to be good at everything, you're usually. I think we should maybe mention we're always stealing from each other. No, there, anything good that comes out of this is because you and I have gestated on all these issues all the time. Well, I think the so. point, the whole point of this is steal from us. You right. know? Act like you made it up. That's fine. <laughs> we don't care because uh, we're going to steal Go from Go home and tell your spouse. So by the way, Stratera, yeah, uh, but so you, uh, I had an old professor of mine from graduate school is you're, you're a jack of all trades and master of none, mm -hmm. um, which is what happens when you play an RPG role playing game, uh, and don't specifically focus on one trait. And so I think that the non stimulants are trying to be the, the jack of all trades and master of none right. sometimes. Um, whenever you've got the stimulants that are a master of attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. I do, I do think if you do have a child who is diagnosed with ADHD and they've got comorbid issues of anxiety, I do like Stratera in a lot of ways yeah. because if you think about those stimulants and they're working on that frontal lobe, I mean, you know, kids who are anxious are already thinking of four or five problems. We don't need them to think of six or seven yep. problems. And so when we get them to Stratera and it's like, okay, maybe this is, you know, going to work on both of these just a little bit. I, right. I, I do like that. You know, if I've got a kid with mm -hmm. comorbid issues, I do think like, okay, maybe Stratera is going to be the best fit for you. I, I, I would imagine if you do have a child or you as an individual are talking to a pediatrician or your primary care physician about ADHD symptoms, you're probably talking about a stimulant medication, and that's probably the first point of intervention. Mm -hmm. But if, if you have a complex kid, and we often, you know, we talk about diagnoses like they're these, you know, it's either vanilla or chocolate. Right. Like kids are rocky road. They're not vanilla and chocolate. It's There's rarely, a lot of things going on. Yeah, we have randomized clinical trials for these specific, which is just, it's very rarely ever that clear cut. Um, and as you were saying that, I don't know why, like clonidine is one that hit me. So clonidine was originally a, uh, it was a blood pressure medication, I believe, but also has an antidepressant effect and also helps focus a little bit. It also helps sleep. It also helps sleep. So, you know, you, you see these off-label prescriptions that in the end are actually kind of better. Um, and if you've got a good physician, they're going to be aware of that stuff. I've got kids who have, uh, ADHD symptoms and, and tics and clonidine works very well for them. Yeah. Help some sleep too. I, I really actually, d despite the fact that we're kind of, you know, bagging on them that they don't work as, as well, I really do like the non stimulants. Um, personally, uh, a lot of children on the autism spectrum present with symptoms of ADHD. Yeah. And then you've got a lot of kids with ADHD who have 
maybe they're nowhere near, you know, looking like they're on the spectrum, but kids with ADHD struggle with social skills, kids with ADHD struggle with sleep, kids with ADHD struggle with other things outside of just, uh, inattention and yeah. hyperactivity. I really do like, and it's a hard sell, but I really do like pairing non-stimulants with stimulants, especially for my kids on the autism spectrum that have comorbid diagnoses of ADHD, which that's probably one other episode when we talk about whether or not both of those are existing in the same place. But uh, I do feel like when you've got a complex kid, pairing a stimulant with a non-stimulant, I think is a great approach. Because if you think about one of them is going here in the frontal lobe Mm -hmm. of the brain and the other one is going with that central nervous system and your central nervous system is all the fight or flight stuff. It's all, you know, should you be trying to kill this or should you be running away from it because it's going to kill you? And if you, if you think about those kids on the spectrum, pairing with them, a medication that says like just pump the brakes a little bit. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is not slow down, yeah. the fight or flight situation yeah. you're thinking it is. I think it goes really great. Well, no, it makes sense. It's, it, well, we have anecdotal experience to speak. I, I've had it. some anecdotal experience with that too. I, I think it, it's not one or the other. Sometimes it's it's both. Um, I, I would think both of us are not into the idea of more medications. Right. You know, I think I think it's it, a re- that's why I said it's a hard sell. Like a parsimony and anything of like finding a simpler explanation for the, the problem and, and a simpler uh, uh, medication too, uh, or simpler treatment. But sometimes it, it really is necessary. And the, the, the amount of times where you see ADHD, particularly like really severe ADHD look like autism. Um, I mean, and it's, it's hard to tell which one it actually really is. Really hard to tell, yeah. And, and we should say there's research that indicates that Children diagnosed on the higher functioning end of the autism spectrum are almost always, not almost always, but very high correlation that they are diagnosed as ADHD in early childhood. The diagnostic criteria they use are almost identical. They have really difficult times focusing on one thing. Right. Um, So, like, functionally, it looks the same. Yeah. I I do like those non-stimulants paired with them. Mm -hmm. And... uh, I think this was like a marketing tool. <laughs> I think it was 10X that, that that sent this out. Don't, don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure it was 10X that said, it's like, a you know, these non-stimulants are like a, a warm bath for your nervous system. And that is freaking really good marketing. That sounds nice. But, I want that. But, I mean, if you think of some of these kids with ADHD and you think of some of these kids on the spectrum, a warm bath for the central nervous system is like, just what the doctor ordered sometimes you know <laughs> yeah one of the so many kids i work with when it was so because we're psychologists we're we don't do medication interventions we're just having this conversation because we experience we, we have so much experience with it uh we're looking at the behavioral interventions if i could just get them to slow down just for a second yeah. just slow down for one second you don't need to act right away if i can do that i did 90 percent of the intervention um and a warm bath on the central nervous system will do that yeah yeah slow down just just a bit just yeah. slow down yeah we, did we talk about tricyclic? We mentioned uh, those So, earlier, so yeah. tricyclic antidepressants, we've talked about that in the SSRI. Um, well, we talked about it in the depression episode, I, I, I'd say. Um, there's some evidence that it could work. Um, there's, it's not a pretty common prescription. I mean, you're, you're not often you're you're going, going to the doctor, doctor and talk that, tricyclics. Yeah. But again, some of those, maybe some of those barriers that have to do with a kid taking a stimulant medication, you know, there are other options out there. Tricyclics have shown to impact symptoms of ADHD, but... Their side effects are so much more severe that you're almost never going to see anybody start there because it's so much easier to manage the non, the, uh, the stimulant medication. When you have a good evidence-based, uh, research-based intervention, you're going to start with that. And if it's not working, then response to intervention, we keep trying something different. So I kind of think eventually like stimulants are going to be available over the counter. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Right. Either. Um, God, I would love that too. <laughs> <laughs> How, how, yeah. how much easier would graduate school have been if you could have just you gone just to Walgreens and picked up some, picked uh, up some Adderall? Yeah. 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 Uh, it, I guess we should mention, by the way, Adderall and, and stimulants easily abused people. You know, uh, people, it, it, it's not just, uncommon. Just that look it, at our expressions. To know <laughs> it's, it's not uncommon that uh, a, uh, a college student who's got to, you know, cram for yeah. For a long time, for, As you, for finals, is, you brought up earlier, it's like performance enhancing kind of yeah. when it comes to 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 intention and and trying to memorize material and trying to stay focused. Yeah. If I had to guess that movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper, like whatever the closest thing we have so have, far to whatever he's taking in Limitless, it's got to be stimulant. That is a, that is coming to my mind like ten times during this episode of like, no, this is Limitless. <laughs> this is Limitless, uh, and I feel like that description of it is like the best description of like what sometimes the stimulants do for people. Yeah. Uh, it's not to the extent of that. I love that movie, by the way, but uh, it's not to the extent of that. It was very similar. I feel like we're, like we should we shouldn't uh, because we are do more better. 
uh, we should at least talk about behavioral stuff. So yeah, again, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, number one, the research does indicate that medication can help these children. Yep. That and even beyond helping kids, the earlier you start it can 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 be very beneficial. I found myself one time. Uh, I think it was almost a shame to say it. it was like a Facebook argument with somebody where there was like an article about a pediatrician giving like a four year old stimulant medication. And somebody was like, Oh, it's always unacceptable that you give a four year old stimulant meds. I don't really think you ought to give a four year old stimulant medication, but I found myself kind of like defending the idea that like, well, one, they do work. And two, I mean, depending on your insurance and depending what you have access to, depending on the family stressors, depending on the family dynamics and what they're capable of, that might've been the intervention that the, the pediatrician thought like, that's, that's the number one thing that's going to help this kid or this family. But the research does indicate the sooner you start the medication interventions, the yeah. better the outcomes. But behaviorally speaking, research says medication can help. The research says behavioral interventions can help. The research says the two together is the most effective. Mm-hmm. And even beyond that, the research has indicated that if you were to, like, depending on the order, if you were to start with behavioral interventions and then introduce medication interventions that's your best most likely outcome. yeah it's your best most likely outcome yeah and we, i think we'll you'll hear us say this throughout this podcast most people don't have disorders and so it's probably best to start with something that is um that has low side effects uh is going to probably like it uh the response intervention it's it's the 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 least the most minimal intervention we can do that's not going to have a problem but like you brought up is not only as research say that the combination of the two is the best so a behavioral intervention which we will talk about if we've not already talked about is is some sort of like reinforcement and punishment and being consistent with that is going to the best outcome but not only to that like the kids who are on that sort of program result in later in life being on lower doses of medication. So it, it seems to help them develop the skills that they need to develop um, while they're on that medication. Mm-hmm. And that medication also might help in that those those consequences and those uh, reinforcements and punishments that we're, the psychologists, the, the do more better people are trying to throw in there, like it helps them learn those mm-hmm. skills. So I think in the end we would just say it's, it's a combination of both. Um, when it, particularly in, when it comes, we're talking only ADHD meds right now, right. You know, I, but I think too, we would probably say the same thing about antidepressants, right? Um, it's the, the combination is what t- seems to be the best. So what's a, what's a solution for people? My thought would be is that if you, if you do really think you have an attention difficulty, go back, so go back to the previous episode, you, you probably should have that assessed. You should probably find out if that is something. It's like, like lots of people think they have attention issues when it's really, you know, slightly off beyond the norm, but it's really not in the disordered range. You know, it's not. Or you've hit something that taps your intellectual capacity. <laughs> yeah, you've you've stepped into something that's a little new for you, so you have to develop some new habits and new skills to 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 effectively uh, perform in that area. But it, it may not mean you have a disorder. But if you've gotten to a point that you you are curious about that, you should probably go talk to somebody and, and, and figure out like, is it to arrange the disorder, either your child or yourself? Um, and then I think the thing that we've been fairly clear on with this is that if it is ADHD, you're probably going to be having a conversation about medication. You should be aware of what the side effects are. You should be aware of what the positive effects are. And to try to come in with an open mind is like, we all have biases. I think our biases when we became a psychologist was kind of like anti-medication. And then we looked at the research and then we were like, okay, well, this works really well. Yeah. And I would be not a very good clinician if I said you should never take medication. Right. Um, because it helps people a lot. Um, now, does it hurt? Yes. There's there's no safe medication. It's always it's always you know cost so, benefit analysis. It's always side effect and symptom reduction. Yeah. We're all, it's all we're trying to figure out is which one is is the best. And so is if you think that, then you should look to some somebody to figure out if you actually do have an issue that is like that is clinical, and then you know you should have a conversation with your your primary care provider about whether or not that would be beneficial for you to look at medication and and know what you're getting into. Yeah. Do you have something you should add to that? Yeah, well. Um... As you were saying it, I, I think like maybe a solution for people is to know that like, yeah, 
Absolutely. Not only can you go, not only should you go talk to your pediatrician about it, but there is nothing wrong with sitting down and having a conversation where you ask questions and talk to your pediatrician and they make a recommendation and then you leave not doing anything. Mm -mm. You don't have to, you just because they said, Hey, I think we ought to try 10 milligrams of Adderall here. doesn't mean that you have to leave and go do it. Go talk to them, go ask them. And if they say, Hey, I think this is what you ought to do. You still don't have to do that. It's, it's probably just a good conversation to be having. And then you, you leave and you talk about it as a family. You talk about it with your spouse, talk about it with your significant other and, right. and see what your, your symptoms are or, or see what your options are. And I also think uh, even if you, if you were hesitant and you did decide to try, remember, it's a pretty, sh- especially with stimulants, it's a pretty short window to decide whether or not it's going to improve. You don't have to tell the school that you're going to do that. You don't have to get. To, you don't have to tell anybody mm. that you're gonna try that medication. Go send your kid to school. I love that. Yeah. Send, send, send your kid to school. See how they do. If you hate it, don't take it again. If you love it, you don't have to tell that teacher. Uh, oh, uh-huh. don't worry. You don't have. You know that that whole conference we had. Don't worry. I, I started my kid on stimulants. Now you don't have to talk to them at mm. all. You can totally do that privately within your family. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, and I would think that we'll get into it at some point. There, there. If you decide you, you're just like some reason against medication that's okay that's who you are and um and if you decide you want to instead meditate for 20 minutes a day and, and build your focus up that way i'm talking to adults at this point right now uh they're, they're that might actually help um and so it like you i guess i guess i'm just reiterating what you said and is then have a conversation decide if it works for you um and then go with it from there i guess, I guess one of the things i think all the time is with my family is this if you are hesitant mm-hmm don't be so afraid of it. And I don't mean do it. I don't mean take the stimulant medication. What I mean is don't be afraid to see what you think and actually try it out. You can maintain your privacy and you don't have to, you, you don't have to, to be a hypocrite. You don't have to uh, commit to something that you're not wanting to commit to. Mm-hmm. There's options. And one of these options can just be a field test to see how it goes with your kid. Yeah. When you said that, the immediate thing that hit me is what you're probably going to do is leave that appointment and go search it on the internet. And what you're going to find is tons of negative uh, reviews of this. Um, I, had, I had a supervisor tell me once that if you do a good job with one of your clients, they'll tell one person. If you do a bad job, they'll tell 10. Yeah. And so if somebody had a bad experience with a stimulant medication, they have gone on Facebook or they have gone on on a blog and they have talked about it. And you're going to see terrible, terrible things. That doesn't mean that's what's going to happen to you. Uh, I would... I think that like when you, if you, I, I, I think as you said that, I was thinking of people going and, and Googling it, you know, and you're going to find horrible things um, because like for the like millions of people out there that stimulants are helping them live their lives very well, they're, they're not even writing about it because they're living their lives really well. Yeah. I, I think you could almost say that for a lot of interventions. I mean, you know, if, if there's a, I don't know, name an intervention and there's probably somebody out there who has tried to make the world know that that intervention is terrible. You know, that, that that's, uh, I had one hit my mind right there when he said, what, what? Oh, the bedtime pass. Well, yeah, should, yeah. bedtime pass is a great intervention for getting your kid to Rock go to sleep. Solid intervention. Yeah. And, and I have seen bad reviews of the bedtime pass where I am like, I don't understand how there is a negative review of this. We'll, we'll have to get into sleep. We'll do an, an or, uh, a sleep episode. Because, uh, there, there are interventions that are just beautifully written that works so well the bell and pad for for enuresis you know that you're gonna see bad stuff on it and and it just comes back to our point it's all about the individual situation whatever is going to be your your situation that's how you ought to evaluate what your options are and where you want to move forward with yep have a good relationship with your primary care provider have them know you you know them and then treat treat them like an individual i'd even recommend starting that way like when you go talk to your PCP or to your pediatrician, just say, by the way, I hate medications and you're going to have to convince me. Just say <laughs> that. That's fine. Okay. Well, I they already just that maybe. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for listening. And as always, you can click like, and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram at mm-hmm. DNB psychology. And, uh, can I throw a plug in maybe? Yeah. If on. you have topics that you would like to see us talk about, please throw those in. Please submit questions to us. Um, we have things we would love to talk about. Um, sometimes people don't want to hear it. Sometimes they do. Uh, I hope they do. Cause <laughs> you're watching this. If you're one of the ones who do, um, but please just throw topics on there or questions. Um, just give us something to talk about. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. 
You can follow us on our Instagram at DMB Psychology for updates and to submit any comments or questions. You can also find us on our website, domorebetter.buzzsprout.com, where we have info on all episodes as well as our donations and merchandise links if you'd like to support the podcast. You can search for us on YouTube and all major podcast platforms under Do More Better.